Okay. Um, <laughs> maybe we should wait for our, uh, our colleague here. Uh, right, so, so uh, hopefully it's okay. I, I swapped around the lecture topics a little bit because I was looking at the hardware lecture I had the last year and I wasn't happy with it. And then so uh, we're, we're going to swap just a tiny bit, but that's okay because you guys have everything you need to do your, your next assignment uh, already anyway. So, so hopefully that's okay. Uh, let's see, in terms of announcements and all that ongoing stuff, we have your graded exams uh, over here. Um, so you're going to have to, sorry, yeah, you, you get to sit through one, one more lecture, but you're free to, to have that back. Um, the usual policy here is, of, of course, if you have any questions about your grade on the exam, feel free to drop by my office hours and, and we'll take care of it. Uh, the, the way that I grade for this class is that we correct for the sort of the mean. Like, I don't correct the exam, but obviously, like, I don't think anybody got a perfect score. There's one or two tricky problems. And that doesn't mean, like, the whole class's grade average goes down, so please don't worry about that. Uh, in general, the exam is worth a pretty small part of your grade. Um, but if you have if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Don't, don't be shy. And uh, Larry and Sophie and I will take the exam ourselves, and, and, which we already did, but we'll do it in a more tidy fashion and, and share the solutions uh, 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 online in the next couple of weeks. Uh, okay. Um, I know the drop. I mean, there's a, there's a, you know it's, it's no secret. The reason we have the exam today we did is because the drop deadline is coming up. Uh, if you have discussions about that, you have any questions for me, you, feel free to reach out. That's, uh, I, I get that. Uh, any questions about the exam? Cool. Uh, right, so all of your remaining responsibilities in this class are one more homework, which is due tomorrow. Tomorrow, good, cool. Uh, so one, one more homework, uh, and then your course project. Uh, and I'm seeing, I, I, I paged through the project proposals. I will email each of you guys personally with feedback in the coming week. It's a little bit of work for me, so it takes some time. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys produce. And, and of course, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll send some of you guys to, to, to sing out the, if there's some stand kind out. Of okay? Um, so remember the way the course project is, is, is structured. You, you wrote your proposal. Uh, in another couple weeks, there's a, a, a check-in due. Um, what I'm looking for in the check-in is evidence that you have written code and that you have a clear outline of like the stuff you're going to do. Yeah, so I'm going to like look for like, a screenshot of some sort. If it's a boring, ugly screenshot, and you just like raster as a triangle, that's fine. Um, and then you know the final project is a, there's a report and a short presentation, which will happen in class time, plus a little extra because this class is, is, is a little too big to fit in an hour and a half slot. That's it. And we're done. We're out of here. Okay. Uh, uh, any procedural things before we get started? Cool. All right. So uh, yeah. So today I swapped out our, our lecture on graphics hardware and, and procrastinated on that a little bit uh, and, and, and replaced it with color, which is a topic I, that, that we all know and love. Uh, and this is an important one in computer graphics. I think actually this is something that that, that we kind of neglect a little bit. I think many of us are, are very algorithms and techy and program oriented, but remember that like. In, in, a, in a discipline like computer graphics, your main client is somebody's eyeball, and, and really understanding that and how it works um, isn't just kind of like useful fun facts, but can actually inform the way that you design computer graphics systems, right? Knowing what your eye tends to be sensitive to can tell you where you should spend your CPU time really adding detail to your, your image. Yeah? Uh, right, so our, our plan today, uh, we'll talk a little bit about color theory, the physics of color, how it reaches into your, your face, I guess into your eye specifically, uh, uh, and then uh, we'll talk about some computational concerns as well. I'm going to go ahead and preface our lecture today uh, by warning you guys that I am not a physicist. If I say anything totally off base, it's probably because I don't know what I'm talking about, which is fine. Uh, so feel free to, to help me out here. Uh, I think you guys have taken physics much more recently than I have. Uh, so that's our agreement. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about light, uh, uh, and in particular with, with all the different things that we've already done wrong uh, in the the ray tracers and rasterization systems that you guys are, are writing in your homeworks. Right? So the reality is that the light's awfully complicated, right? Um, you know, when when you guys are doing your homework, what are you doing? You're rendering red, green, and blue channels into the computer. Uh, but of course, the reality is that that light. It's a spectrum, and, and, and that, that involves not just you know, the, the, the visible wavelengths, but of course, um, uh, invisible ones as well, right? including short uh, wavelengths like X-ray, uh, UV, uh, and, and longer ones like, like radio. Right? And, and actually, this is already suggested with some interesting applications of, of things that we've talked about in this class. Right? So uh, for instance, people that are designing solar panels uh, actually do use ray tracers to understand 
the light that's going to reach into uh, their, their, their power generation facility. Uh, but in their case, they don't care about simulating visual light like we do in graphics discipline, but maybe all of the energy that's going to reach into the panel uh, that their, their wafers are testing to. Right? They have exactly the same algorithms. Uh, it's actually kind of fun to talk to those guys. They really do you know, ray tracing the shadows and all these things that we talked about. Uh, so when we see uh, a light around us, uh, the reality is that you sort of have some object that looks like this, right? There's some function of wavelength uh, where the, you know, the x-axis is the length of your, you know, your wavelengths of your, 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 your light uh, ray, uh, and the vertical axis is how much energy is in that different wavelength. Yeah? And so the, the vocabulary word here is that you're really looking at the spectrum of light, and I think this is a term we've all heard before, right? And then basically when I say spectrum, what I'm talking about is for every wavelength, how much energy is that wavelength? And this is a distribution. In fact, even in the mathematical sense, it's a distribution, right? There's, there's one value per uh, number on the horizontal axis, which already is telling us that something has gone a little wrong in our graphics system, right? Because how many numbers do we produce? We produce three, right? Red, green, and blue. But of course, if we really wanted to simulate light in our, in our graphics system, we wouldn't be able to just have three values. We need all of these different values and all these different channels. Right, so already we can see, and I think this is a point that's really neglected in graphics class, that from the ground up, the systems that you guys have been engineering are human-oriented. Right? Like if you showed your dog your computer screen, they wouldn't perceive color the way that we do. Yeah. Okay. Um, of course, if we look at the spectrum of different uh, uh, objects, we can see some pretty cool things. Uh, this is my favorite uh, example of this. So here's the spectrum of the Crayola crayon box. <laughs> Right, so every uh, uh, a crayon might look pretty uh, simple to you guys, but in fact, uh, if I shine on a kind of an even distribution of light energy and it comes off of the crayon, that's really complicated spectrum. This actually caught me by surprise. Like when you have you know a red crayon, it's not just that it's like it's a little blip right in a, a red wavelength, but there's actually this full distribution of, of energy that that, that like goes across. Yeah, um, and, and and the reason why we we sort of view the simple colors that we do because our eyes are essentially like really, really good compression algorithms that take this complicated uh, function of, of x and, and just output a few simple values like brightness and, 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 and color. Yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about how we sense color. Uh, and, and you know, <laughs> A37 has these really dated slides and I, I kind of love them, so I left the images the same. Uh, right, so, so, so let's say uh, we've got this, this 80s kid and he's holding an apple in his hands here. Uh, and of course the apple is red, and, and we want to understand the mechanism uh, beyond uh, what's going on here. Uh, certainly he does, he, like, he looks very enthusiastic. Uh, right, so, so the reality is that there's a lot of different spectra that are involved in, in perceiving light. Right? And, and, and uh, it's not just the color of the apple that comes into play, I think you all know this intuitively. Uh, but of course, uh, for one thing, maybe he's standing outside, right? so there's the spectrum of, of the light that's coming out of the sun. Right, so the sunlight energy maybe has, apparently has a, a peak around 500 nanometer. Um, and now uh, the apple has its own spectrum. Right? In other words, the, the skin of this apple tends to absorb certain types of light and reflect other types of light out. Right? Uh, so in this case, I guess it reflects out uh, red. You see the high wavelength. Uh, and, and, and it absorbs in, uh, the, the different parts of the light spectrum. And what you observe at the end of the day is actually the product of these two things. Does that make sense? So like, there's kind of two ingredients you need to be able to see color. One is that the color needs to be in your light bulb, and the other is that you need to have it reflected off of the shape that you're looking at. Right? And, and, and of course we already kind of know that. Right? Like if I shine a green light on a red apple, I might see nothing. Yeah? Uh, of course the reality is that even green light probably includes some uh, energy in, in the other parts of the spectrum, which is why it's not just totally black. Uh, uh, but of course, the, the, the color you absorb off of the apple doesn't just depend on the apple itself, but rather the environment around it. <coughs> yeah? uh, and this is going to start an awful lot. It's going to start to sound an awful lot like linear algebra. Yeah. Because what are we doing? Well, we have two different functions. In this case, of, of the x-axis of nanometer, and multiply them together. And then, of course, what do I observe at the end of the day? It's kind of the integral of these things. Yeah. So this sounds an awful lot like when we were talking about Fourier analysis, right? And, and, and that's no that's no mistake. In fact, I mean, we've already used the word wavelength. In this and, and it's exactly the same uh, notion here. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, right, and, and of course the way that you observe that is maybe I now, you know, this guy takes his apple and he goes inside into uh, depressing classrooms like this one, and so now there's a neon uh, lamp, and of course now the apple itself looks different, right? And, and that's not because the apple changed, uh, that's because the light bulb changed. Yeah. 
I think this is a little bit of a pedantic point, but hopefully you guys uh, kind, of, kind of see what's going on here. And in fact, if you look at the reflected power spectrum, what do you see? Well, the apple has this nice kind of error function looking spectrum, um, but what you observe is this thing with these funny peaks, and that doesn't have to do with the apple, but rather the fact that um, neon lights have really bizarre uh, uh, spectra. Right? This has to do with the, the physical mechanisms that go on inside of a light bulb, right? the very particular atoms that get excited and reflect off particular uh, wavelengths. Okay, so that's our, our picture so far, um, and, and these are our, our different distributions. You can see the, the same apple reflects off two very different things, uh, depending on, on the color. Yeah, um, so of course, uh, uh, you know, this is really all, all, all the picture that's going on, uh, but there's one key ingredient missing in our story so far. Right? We have the sun, we have the apple, and of course the third uh, character here is this guy's friend, uh, Harry Potter, who's uh, looking at this apple and observing a particular uh, a set of wavelengths, right? So in fact, you're kind of multiplying three things together, right? There's the intensity that comes out of the light bulb, the intensity that the apple is kind of willing to reflect, and then the intensities that your eye is sensitive to, and those three guys all interact uh, to create what we call color. And again, this is a perceptual effect. You see that? This is not somehow, you know, something that, that occurs in nature. This has to do with how your brain works. Yeah? Okay, so from that perspective, of course, uh, you know, in, in computer science and in engineering, we spend a lot of time talking about how we should understand who our client is. Uh, and in this case, uh, your client is, is, is likely uh, this object right here, which is an eyeball. Adding to the list of things that your instructor is not, I'm also not an anatomist. Uh, so we're going to have a systems perspective on how your, your eyeball works. Yeah, so let's, let's rotate him uh, 90 degrees here. Uh, and, and roughly, uh, this is what happens. So the light has you know, come off of the sun, is reflected off of the apple and come into your eye. It enters into a lens uh, uh, in the front of your eye called the cornea. This is a fixed focus lens, meaning that you know, if I look at stuff close or uh, far away, uh, the focus of this thing doesn't change, it doesn't bend. After that, it goes through uh, the pupil and the iris, right, which is this adjustable opening. <coughs> this is just like how a camera works, right? When I have a photograph, if I have a lot of light in my scene, I make the entry point for the camera very small because I kind of want to limit the amount of light that goes inside. But if I'm in a dark room, then I need all the light I can get to get an interesting photo, right? And that's roughly what's going on in this piece of your eye, <laughs> roughly. Uh, uh, after that, um, and that's also what creates these nice eyeball-looking things. By the way, one of my early jobs as, as a computer vision researcher was working on iris recognition, and there's some really fun uh, things you can learn about the anatomy of, of that piece of your eye. Um, after that, uh, the light goes through yet another object in your eye, which is the crystalline lens, and this is the adjustable one. Right? So think roughly like a piece of plastic that you can bend. Right? Uh, and the idea is as you bend it, you're changing the, the, the focal point of your eye. I can see an experiment happening right in front of me here. Uh, uh, so if you, you know, if you hold up your hand and you look at it through one eye, your hand is sharp, but everything behind it is blurry. Right? And the reason for that is, of course, that your eye isn't, you know, a, a, what is it, a camera and screw up, but rather there's a positive, finite amount of space here, uh, and that makes stuff a little blurry. You only get one focal point at a time. Right? And so your eye is designed to, uh, to compensate for that. Uh, of course, we can see all the different things that, that can go wrong. I mean, it's a, it's a total miracle of evolution that this entire mechanism evolved to be the way it is. Uh, and so it comes as no surprise that, you know, developmentally it's, it's a thing that fails a lot. And of course many of us uh, are, are very familiar with that. Okay, so uh, after the, the, the light goes through your cornea, through uh, the pupil, into the, the crystalline lens, finally it's really in the inside of your eyeball. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it has been focused appropriately. And, and where does it end up is actually in the back of your, your eye, right? Roughly this kind of spherical object. Uh, after going through uh, something called the vitreous humor, which is roughly just a bunch of goo, I'm sure it has all kinds of important biological meaning that, that I'm, I'm not familiar with. Um, some of us, uh, including myself, have the pleasure of, of, of being able to see your, your vitreous humor, because uh, it's pretty common to have stuff kind of floating around in it, uh, which can create visual problems. And then finally, uh, at the end of the day, the light hits the back of your eye, uh, and it reaches the retina, and these are your, your photoreceptors. One thing to notice, of course, is what happened to the light rays when they went into your eye? This is one of the amazing things that happens in your brain. So, so let's say I'm, I'm looking out at, at you guys, I can see the clock here. The clock is up, yeah? But is the clock up in the inside of my eye? No, right? The, 
clog, it goes through and it flips over as it goes through the lens of my eye. So actually what, what your, your, your brain is observing is an upside down picture of the world and it's just correcting it for you. Yeah. Uh, and of course the way that it does that is through this bunch of cables that are connecting from the back of your eye into whatever else happens inside of you. Yeah. This is the optic network. Yeah, so, so from a computer science perspective, your eye is some piece of hardware. It converts light signals into chemical ones, and, and the chemical ones, of course, are, are, are what happens inside of your brain. And, and let's dig in a little bit into what's actually going on in your retina, because sort of that's the, the imaging device that's inside of your, your eye, and, and the one that we really should understand when we create visual content. Yeah. Now, when it comes to visual sensors, we actually have two, at least two, I'm sure, like a biologist can identify even many more. Uh, but, but there are two basic uh, types of sensors that happen in your eye. These are rods and cones. Uh, so the rods in your eye are sensitive to light energy, so just like bright versus dark. Uh, the cones are sensitive to color. How many think we have more rods than cones? More cones than rods. We're just, how many of us just can't even, we're not gonna raise our hand, I can stand here all day. Yeah, so, so, okay, so the answer is that you have uh, 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 many more rods than, than you have uh, cones. In fact, even if the slide says it, I'm going to say no. But, right, and this makes a lot of sense. Right? Because um, if I'm trying to figure out if I'm, I'm walking into a wall or not, uh, chances are the color of the wall is not terribly important. What's, what's important is the, its, it's presence, uh, which you can get from a black and white uh, image. Yeah. Uh, so you have more rods and, and fewer cones, um, and, and, and there's sort of two types of uh, eye vision that's going on. One is called scotopic vision uh, for low light, uh, and for high light vision you have photopic vision. Uh, and, and largely your scotopic vision is, is, uh, is kind of governed by the rods in your eye, right? Because there's not enough photons bouncing around in a dark room to give you a meaningful color signal. But instead, you're just trying to figure out like how to not bump your toes into the bed while you're Bathroom. Whereas during the day, there's plenty of light moving around, uh, and you can get a much more, more detailed uh, uh, picture. Yeah? Uh, of course, kind of a corollary of that, um, chemically, is, is that your rods tend to be uh, uh, kind of uh, slower response, and your cones are more fast, uh, because maybe they're sensitive to detail, uh, whereas the, the rods are going to get past the, 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 the high level picture. Yeah? And so it's this amazing system that's going on inside of your eye, it's totally optimized for like not walking into stuff in the middle of the night, you know, not getting hunted when you can't see anything, all, all these kinds of uh, crazy evolutionary traits. From an algorithmic perspective, uh, what can we do? What, how can we, how can we use this fact to, to make our, our algorithms faster? So in particular, your eye is very sensitive to changes in intensity and not terribly sensitive to changes in color. Any ideas? So here's one that actually probably happens inside of your phone. Well, these days maybe not, because your phone's processor is really fast. But maybe five, ten years ago, this was certainly the case. Um, so one kind of trick is, let's say I have an image processing algorithm. So a couple years ago, the popular one uh, was to take a photograph and blur it out while kind of preserving sharp edges. So this is something called bilateral filter. Actually, Fredo Duran, one of the faculty here, was, was one of the early sort of inventor of, of algorithms for this kind of stuff. And, and one thing you can do, uh, which is really sneaky, uh, it, it, is let's say that my algorithm is like almost fast enough, but like a factor of two or three times too slow to run inside of my, my phone. One trick that people do in, in industry a lot is, is you'll take your RGB photograph, and rather than running your image filter on the photo, you'll convert it to two separate channels, right? one for color and one for brightness. You'll filter the brightness channel, and then you'll just slap the two back together. So in other words, like if, if I have an algorithm for blurring out an image, this is actually a screenshot from one of my own research papers, uh, uh, then what you can do is just blur out the high frequencies in the brightness part. But actually, there's still plenty of high frequency color. So for instance, if we zoom in um, this little tree in the background of this photograph, I don't know if you guys can see this on the Notice what's going on here is that I ran uh, this algorithm for blurring out a photo. And you can see, it, indeed, it's blurry in, in the brightness sense, right? That there's just a bunch of gray here and a bunch of, of clouds out there. But if you look really closely at the zoomed-in thing here, you'll notice that from pixel to pixel, the color's changing. Yeah? And that's because what I did is I converted it to HSV, right? Hue, saturation, value. Come back to that in a minute. And I just filtered uh, the, the, the value, the brightness channel. Yeah? So suddenly, my algorithm is three times faster. Right? I only processed 
uh, one third of my data. That's, that's a sneaky trick uh, that happens a lot in, in graphics plans. So you can see already there's an interplay here between understanding how my eye works and how to make my computer faster. Yeah, which is not uh, uh, something that I think you're going to see in, in the, the, you know, the, the, the algorithms class. Um, right, uh, there, there are all kinds of other uh, things you might have to to make display technology. So another kind of fun fact um, is your, your, your rods, right? Remember those are the, the intensity sensitive things. Tend to be distributed on the kind of periphery, the peripheral part of your vision. The cone's right on the center. In other words, by the way, like something you might not know is that, of course, a lot of the color that you guys sense when you look around is just basically invented by your brain. But you actually have very few color sensors inside of your eye, and you're just kind of hallucinating the rest. Uh, but uh, uh, right, um, there's all kinds of funny structure going on inside of your, your retina, um, and part of that is that on the periphery, all you really care about is intensity. And that makes sense because if somebody's sneaking up from your side, you want to detect that they're there. There's also actually a blind spot right in the middle of your vision. You might not know this, um, but there's actually, like, if you can, it's very hard to get people to keep their eyes still. Uh, but if you can, you can actually place something right in front of them. You won't see it. Um, what implications might this have? How could I design, actually, as, as we start to do, this was popular maybe in the 90s, and then people sort of, computers got fast enough that we could just <coughs> do extra calculation. It wasn't a big deal. But now that the, the, the virtual reality headsets and so on, uh, we, we care about speed again. What, what, how can I use uh, this, this fact for, for display technology? You guys have any ideas? So in other words, I only really care about detail right at the center of what I'm looking at. So I'll, I'll give you a hint. So, so at this point, there's technology for tracking where you're looking. Yeah? So what can I do? So like, for example, VR headsets will have a higher resolution, like higher pic pixel density, and you're in the center of the display and like lower. Like you got it. Rendering. Yeah, so I can put more of my rendering work in the part of the image that I'm going to actually see. Uh, and then the kind of periphery where, I, you know, my eye is really just sensing the kind of high level picture. Maybe I don't put so much work into it to render. Um, where can that go wrong? So the one thing that your eye is really good at is getting signals quickly. Yeah. Uh, and, and so your algorithm for tracking where your eyeball is it needs to be faster than the sensitivity of your eye, right? Because there would be nothing worse than a system where I look to the right and it's blurry for a second, and then my system realizes that you look to the right and then it puts the, all the detail over there. Uh, and that's largely why people stopped studying this in the 90s, because the technology just wasn't there yet. Um, but, but I think we're, we're reconsidering it now. Uh, so I included a link in the, in the slides to some kind of cool research papers from long ago that may be worth reconsidering at this point, um, where really they do these kind of perceptual studies of like, look <coughs> here, and now I'm going to do physical simulation, but like do something totally crazy on the outside uh, and, and see if you notice. Uh, and often the answer is no. Right? Um, there are all kinds of YouTube videos that are really troubling that. I think the famous one is with the people playing basketball and they ask you to like track the, the number of times the ball's been thrown around. No? Have anyone seen this? That one's fun. Go, go on YouTube and <laughs> uh, uh, you know, basketball vision test. Okay. So right. So let's uh so we're continuing to dive into more and more detail here about how your eye works. Uh, and in particular, uh, our lecture today is about color, uh, but we haven't told you exactly how, how that how that goes. Yeah? So let's talk about your, your cones, right? Remember, those are the, the color-sensitive part of your eye. Uh, and in particular, your cones have a frequency response, right? In other words, you remember that, like, just when, when we talk about that apple, there's some fraction of light that gets absorbed by the apple and some fraction that gets reflected out. And of course, the relevant uh, quantity for perceiving the apple is the light that gets reflected out. Uh, the relevant thing for your, your rods, or rather your cones, is um, the amount that gets absorbed, right? Because that's the chemical signal that gets sent back into your brain. Yep, so your, your, your cones actually divide into three types. There's short, medium, and long range, yeah? And they have frequency response, uh, like I've showed you here. Um, and notice that there's something really strange already. Um, in particular, the short wavelength cones are, are quite distant from, from the medium and long, and, and the medium and long overlap a ton, yeah? So again, you know, sort of philosophically, so it's a little bit amazing. We see all this detail around us, and the reality is, like, we have three codes that are taking a very small part of the <laughs> spectrum, and two of them are basically like, almost the same. Yeah. Um, right. So if if we look, uh, in fact, in the back of your eye, they're arranged in some kind of mosaic. 
uh, and they're not in equal proportions, so you are extremely sensitive to red light, somewhat sensitive to green light, and not sensitive at all to uh, blue light. Yeah, so in, a, in, a, in a ratio of about 150 to 100 to 1. 100 to 1. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, this is like my favorite fun fact in graphics class uh, because it's got extremely practical application. Um, so, so if you uh, go on the highway at night and, and you drive, uh, you leave at MIT, you go on, it's the one that, that kind of cuts above the city. And, and, and uh, you drive past, and, the, and there's a bunch of offices for different companies that you'll see. Yeah? And, and some of them, um, uh, I don't know, some of the grocery stores like Stop and Shop have, have logos that are red. Uh, and other ones, most notably Walmart, has a logo that is blue. Yeah? And, and typically, you know, during the day, I don't think you notice this, but I think at night, uh, especially, if, if you drive past and you look at the Walmart sign, what does it look, what does it look like? It looks blurry. Yeah, and the reason for that isn't that you're like you're somehow not focusing on it the right way, that like blue light is just hard to somehow like, judge depth or something. It's that you have so few uh, cones that are sensitive to blue light, it's actually much harder to read speed signs that are blue uh, than in other colors. Yeah? Uh, that's why actually I think personally the, 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 it was kind of a mistake on, on, on in Walmart's part choosing that color, because you, you really can't read it this time. Um, yeah, and in fact, occasionally, if you're really good, you guys should take a photo and send it to me. You'll see, you know, uh, street signs like this where you have like some blue text and some red, and you'll see them right next to each other. The blue text is hard to read. Yeah, this is not a not a theoretical problem. Yeah, and so anyway, I encourage you to do this in the middle of the night. It's probably hard in Boston because there's a lot of places. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, that's that's the basics of how your eye works. Uh, right there, there's rods and cones, and and then among the cones, there's a different distribution of, of color sensitivity. Um, by the way, when it comes to taking photographs, if you take Fredo's course on, on computational photography, uh, you'll learn about the sensor in the back of your camera. Uh, and, and, and one thing that we know, uh, ah, I'm forgetting the name of this pattern. Does anybody in Fredo's class remember the name of the pattern in the, the back of the camera? No. Uh, in any event, uh, 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 your camera really just has sens sensors that are sensitive to brightness. Right? They, don't, they, don't, they don't know about color. And so what they do, uh, at least old cameras, would put tiny little color filters in front of the different sensors, so like red and green and blue, in some pattern in the back of your camera. Yeah, um, this is actually a bit of a problem because there's a, a, there's a computational challenge called demosaicing, which is that well the red photograph I got is slightly offset from the blue one, and if I put them on top of each other, then like sharp edges in my photo might get blurred out. Um, but but that aside. Uh, Bayer pattern, that's what it's called. The, 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 the Bayer pattern of, 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 the, of these red, uh, green, and blue uh, sensors in, your, in your, your camera are actually laid out in a very particular way. Or what they do uh, is they try to kind of imitate this pattern here. So there's sort of red, red, green, and blue, and like little pattern, you know, groups of four. And so the reason for that is uh, you can, your eye cares much more that your photograph is, is correct in the red channel than the green and the blue. Um, so they, they put more of the sensors in the back of your camera to sensing red than the other two colors. Yeah. Again, the point today is just that like this stuff isn't just fun facts. It really is how we, we engineer this technology. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about how we actually got to this point. Like, how do we know there are all these curves uh, around? Um, so one thing you might do first is, is as kind of a model is to say, well, well, how excited does do my cones get when I uh, shine a particular color of light in, into my eye. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, how would we measure that? Well, for one thing, we have this plot, which is the sensitivity of your, your cone, in this case, the green one. Now you have another thing, which is the, uh, the power distribution of the light. And what do you think I do when I want to measure the, the sort of excitement of, of, of my, my neurons to this particular signal? Remember our Fourier lecture? How do we determine sort of how much these two guys have in common? Don't all speak once. Two things, they're functions of x. We want to know how much they overlap. So we can multiply them together and sum them up like that product. Yeah? You guys are killing me today. My dad's here. You gotta, you know, get that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, right, so yeah, so we, we, we multiply these two things together and integrate, and, and this is going to tell us the, uh, the level of, of excitement of our, 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 our rods and our cones. If we know these two curves, right, the, uh, the reflected amount of light and the, uh, uh, the, the sensitivity of the, the machinery inside. Okay? And essentially, this is just a way of measuring how much time overlaps. 
Yeah. So in reality, what do we sense? At the end of the day, we sense oh, your eye is, is actually computing an integral. You might not know it. Uh, but in fact, there's sort of three functions, L, M, and S of lambda. Right? These are the sensitivity at a particular wavelength, lambda, of your eye to each of these three guys. And then this is the spectrum of your light. And essentially what is getting read off in the back of your eye are just three numbers, right? the dot product between phi and these three functions. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and so at the end of the day, this is a little disappointing, right? There are all these cool infinite dimensional objects that are sitting right in front of us, right? There's, there's a power distribution of the light that's going into your eye. There are these functions here. And, and, and what do you actually get to see at the end of the day is just three numbers, right? L, M, and S. Yeah? Um, and in fact, this, this uh, story is one that, that should sound pretty familiar to you. Right? So if you took uh, those frequency response things, you put them in big long vectors, row vectors in this case, and you think of the spectrum of the light coming into your eye as a column vector, right? and really, all that's going on is big data. Okay. So if, if those of you who have, uh, have taken machine learning uh, might th view this as an extremely low rank projection, right? you have a really, really long list of numbers, which is all the colors in the world, and you see three of them. Yeah, uh, 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 and so that's our, our conclusion so far, is there's an infinite number of colors, we just can't see them. Yeah, and of course we, we hear about that, right? Like dogs, I think, have like four different sensors, and we only have three. Uh, and, and, and so uh, these three numbers are extremely important. Uh, these are tri-stimulus values. That's what L, M, and S are. Uh, and they're not just detectors of one wavelength. We call them like the red, green, and blue sensors, but like you guys saw, they're actually curves. Which makes sense, right? If I, if I adjust the, the intensity or the, the wavelength of light a little bit, I can still see it. It's not like there's just one tiny blip that, that I can see. Okay? Everybody with me so far? I'm, I'm communicating with you guys by disappointment in the human visual system, right? There's like so much cool stuff that we just can't see. Yeah? Uh, okay. Uh, right. And, or, so, yet another way to draw a picture and then stop dwelling on this is, of course, you have the stimulus, like the light going on, uh, going in. The cone response is multiply. So there's a, color, there's a corollary of our, our story so far, right? which is there's an infinite amount of different colors in the world, but we can only see three. So clearly, there must exist two different colors that look the same to us. Yeah? Uh, uh, and, and that makes sense. It's just like in linear algebra, right? Like if I take a four-dimensional problem and I project it down to a two-dimensional one, there are a lot of different things that project to the same place. That's exactly what's going on here. Yeah? Uh, and, 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 and in fact, those uh, things have a name. They're called metamers. Right? So, so metamers are like spectral compositions that create the same tri-stimulus values. That's a mouthful. All it means is different distributions of light that, 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 that look the same to, to you. Yeah? Uh, and of course, this has uh, an important implication uh, for the way we make displays, which is that notice your computer screen isn't a piece of technology for reproducing a whole spectrum of light. Right? In fact, your, your computer screen is, is, is probably pretty boring. Like, there's just some light bulb that's sitting in the top here, which, uh, which has a constant color. And then all you're doing is kind of putting little filters in front of it. Um, and in fact, the, the basic implication here is that we can simulate the visual effects of any wavelength by just kind of stimulating those three cones in a very careful way. Yeah? Uh, when I say any wavelength, we're going to see that that's a little suspicious, right? Because the new algebra doesn't care about negative numbers, uh, and, and we get a little bit of trouble for that. Uh, but, but most wavelengths, uh, we, we do again. Yeah. Um, right, and so actually this, uh, this phenomenon of, of metamerism is, is really the, the, the critical piece on which your, your displays, whether there's projectors, computer screens, or, or what have you, is built, right? Because essentially when I take a photograph, like I go outside, I, I walk out onto the, the bridge over there, I take a photo, and then I display it on my computer screen, I'm not simulating the light that went into my camera. Do you see that? I'm simulating some metamer of the light that went into my camera because that's all my computer screen knows how to display. Okay. Right. So, so, so of course, there are all kinds of details about metamerism which are kind of fun. So these lectures a lot of just like kind of fun facts and, and, and things that are, are worth knowing. Um, there are a lot of, of things uh, worth knowing about uh, this phenomenon. Uh, one is that, of course, things that are metamers under one light source might not be in another. Right? Like it could be that some light source has equal parts green and blue, and for some reason they mix together in the same way. Um, and and uh, of course, people leverage that for, for all kinds of other reasons, right? Like there's uh, consultants whose job it is to, to choose the lighting and, and, and clothing store very carefully to make sure that like you know your clothes look like they match and look good uh, in the store. Because so they don't 
really care what you look like when you're tracing around in the woods. Right? Um, and, and, and so another way of putting that is that, that context matters a lot for color perception. Right? The way a color looks indoors is not the way that it'll look outdoors. And in fact, uh, it might be that two things that look the same indoors look different outside because of the distribution of light. Yeah? Of course, uh, very recently, uh, there was a phenomenon that broke the internet uh, this one, uh, so we have to we have to take a vote here. How many of you guys uh, see what is it? Uh, blue and and, 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 and black in, in the dress on the left. Does anybody see uh, what, yellow and, and, and yellow and white? Yeah, one or two. Interesting. You guys are just ridiculous. It's definitely blue and black. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't I don't even see how this is a question, but, but apparently it is. Uh, even you know Taylor Swift and, and Kim Kardashian made it, um, but but really this is a kind of an extreme example of where where context matters a lot. So if I recall, what's going on in this photograph is that it, it was like this kind of awkward photo that doesn't really fit into your brain's model of what a photo kind of should look like uh, in a store with some funny lighting, and you have to interpret whether this thing is indoors or or outdoors, and, and sort of depending on the context, you might view this as a reflective dress uh, or, or you know that's really gold or or you know inside. Uh, what it really is, which is the blue uh, and the black. Okay, so that's our, our, our big picture so far. That really, you know, in, 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 in computer graphics, this is just secretly a linear algebra class. I think we've seen that a lot of times. And this is just another example where really your color perception is just a big dot product um, with three different vectors, right? And that's really what you see uh, at the end of the day. Unfortunately for us, those three vectors are not orthogonal to one another, and that makes our life a little bit of a headache. Yeah? In particular, um, what does it uh, imply about displays? Well, it means that I can't, if I have a red, green, and blue sensor in my camera, right, and I want to display it, it's not just a question of taking exactly those intensities and, and shining them back out. There's a matrix I have to invert there. Uh, and, and it's actually kind of a funny effect that, that happens. We'll come back to that. Um, of course, there's some other things worth knowing. Uh, one is, you know, of course, not all of us uh, are, are, are fortunate to have uh, three uh, color sensors. Uh, in, in fact, color blindness is a pretty common um, affliction. And essentially, now we have all the machinery we need to explain uh, what's going on, right? Is that you already have different ratio inside of your eye between the different uh, uh, types of sensors uh, among the different cones. Uh, and people with color uh, blindness uh, typically are just missing uh, one type yeah? or have a, a fewer other. Uh, there are many different types. Uh, I believe, I believe most color blindness is largely a male-linked trait, but I could be wrong. Um, but uh, you know, they, they depend on essentially, you know, which which of these three objects you're missing. And I'm not even going to attempt to print out three different types of, of, of names here. Um, there are also some some other kind of interesting uh, 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 cases that are, are less common. Uh, so some people have shifted sensitivity. So in other words, they have roughly the same proportion of, of rods and cones and types of cones and so on. Um, but for whatever reason, the response curve uh, is a little different. So actually, the color that, that, that these people see is just they experience the world differently from, from everybody else. Uh, and I believe there is a, a extremely uncommon trait where, where people actually have uh, four types uh, of, of color sensitivity. Okay, so, so the typical color blindness test looks something like these, right? So here are these arrays of, of different dots and there are different colors. Um, I'm not going to survey you guys because that's private information as to whether you can see the numbers or not. But roughly what they do is they take, uh, so for example, here is the letter, what, hopefully three. <laughs> uh, and uh, 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 essentially what, what they do is uh, there's a three that's traced out right here. And the colors inside of the three are metamers with the colors on the outside, but only metamers for people with a particular uh, species of color blindness. Right? This so is a very quick test to, to see if you have it. Um, I'm noticing now that the color blindness is much easier on my laptop screen than on this screen, and I wonder if that has to do with the, <coughs> the light bulb projector. Right. Uh, and so uh, essentially, the idea is that you have to design these things really carefully so that the color contrast uh, is, is, is what you see. Uh, rather than the uh, intensity difference in these things. Uh, this one's particularly hard, actually. Uh, I, if I get right up on top of it, you can download these slides on your laptop and, and administer your own color blindness test. This is, you should go to a doctor and if, like, don't trust your, your professor's assessment here. Um, but if you, if you convert to uh, uh, yeah, just brightness, you can see the snake hiding in there. Um, yeah, that one, actually, I can't, I can't see it on the screen. That's a more subtle. Uh, one of the kind of cool uh, examples of this is, is uh, actually a painter, uh, 
I forget what, what era this guy is, is from, but it actually was, was color line, um, this guy more young. And, and you can see it in his paintings, right? Because they kind of mix together colors that like most people wouldn't expect to see in the sky uh, in, in his paintings, and because that's, that's how he perceives that. Kind of cool. Okay, so that's enough on the analytical side. Now for the rest of class, we need to talk about the display side, right? So we've talked about how to measure color, and now I have a computer screen, and what do I know? I know that my computer screen is not capable of outputting all these colors now. It's, output of, it's capable of outputting three. But yeah, I can get some pretty good detail on my screen with all kinds of different colors. Yeah? And that's, that's the piece that's missing. Right? So we're going to try and reproduce colors. And again, this is reproducing color that's seen by a human. Yeah? So if you have your dog like look at an apple, and you take a photograph and display it on your screen, your dog is going to be like, like this, these are all the same. Like, they're, 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 sorry. Right? It's, it's because we've engineered your screen uh, for, for your viewpoint only. Yeah? Um, and so again, basically we're, we're kind of, in a sense, kind of lazy, right? Our computer screens aren't attempting to reproduce the full spectrum. They're just trying to match colors up to metamorphism so because that's all that matters uh, for your perception. Actually, an interesting question I was thinking about as preparing was that like, if people have these shifted color perception, whether computer screens bother them somehow because, because they're, they're not engineered for that. And I actually, I don't know the answer. Um, okay. Uh, right, so, so today we're going to talk about um, the kind of basic uh, 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 synthesis uh, problem where we have a computer screen uh, which has maybe some matrix of, of red, green, and blue color values. Um, I think uh, on modern screens this is hard to see, but maybe 10, 10 years ago if you got really ran up on top of your CRT and you really got close, you can see that your screen is really a bunch of, of red, green, and blue dots. That's more or less true here, it's just that you have a lot of them and, and it's hard to, hard to find. Yeah. So that leads uh, to a computational problem, which is how much of these three colors do I need to reproduce a given, uh, a given target? Yeah? Uh, and, and, and so uh, right, this is uh, trying to, to reproduce a particular type of, of tri-stimulus values. Uh, and, and indeed, this is, this is a really tricky problem. Right? In particular, uh, these, these filters that are coming out of your screen have a particular frequency response. It's not the same as the sensor, nor is it the same as the stuff in your mind. Yeah, hopefully you guys see this. This is tricky stuff. So first, let's talk about the wrong way to do this. Yeah. So the wrong way to do this would be I have my camera. I have my, my camera. Here it is. I still have two cameras. And uh, I, I take a photograph, right? And, and my, my, my camera lens has red, green, and blue sensors on it, right? And those light up. Maybe I get some particular voltages. And now I just have my voltages that go into my computer screen be exactly the same as those three numbers. Initially, that kind of feels right. But it, it turns out that that's, that's incorrect, yeah? So, so let's see why. So, so let's say that I have uh, this magenta color, right? So it's mostly blue, it's got a little bit of green and, 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 and red in it, yeah? Uh, right, so if I, if I do that, um, I don't get the right uh, response. And the reason is that your cones overlap in their sensitivity, right? And so if I point out this, you know, the amount of green that I see plus the amount of red that I see, in fact, the overlap means that I'll actually see something that's probably almost two times as bright as, as what I really want. Can I see that? This is basically the difference between matrix and its inverse. Yeah? Uh, and, and so the, the, the term for this, I don't know why there's a term for it, because it's essentially just a bug, like it's something you did wrong, uh, but they call this pollution. Um, and, and this is really a, kind of a, a fundamental issue. Right? The idea is that your, your spectrum is, is some infinite dimensional object, uh, but there, there's a couple rules of the game. One is that negative light, as far as I know, doesn't exist. Um, and the other is that these response curves are not orthogonal. So in other words, I can't think of that dot product that happened in my eye as, as a projection into a basis, right? They overlap. Okay. So the kind of interesting thing is well, now we can talk about it like a matrix inverse. Back in the day, people didn't know that. <laughs> and, and so in fact, they kind of, in a sense, derived really strange matrix inversion algorithms in the process of doing color uh, experiments. It's kind of fun to look at. Uh, 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 and, and the very famous one is, is something called CIE. Uh, and, and so in reality, all the computational systems just going invert a 3 by 3 matrix. Um, it's worth understanding a little bit about how uh, people came to that, that discovery. And of course, uh, one of the things that people do uh, is, is, is write down different color spaces. Essentially, these are three different numbers that express a color in different ways. Right? So for instance, the three colors might express the different cone sensitivity in your eye that wouldn't be terribly useful for 
uh, a, a graphic system because it, you would have to do some transformation on that to, to display. So the RGB values that we store instead are probably closer to like the voltages that your, your screen is outputting. Yeah? And these things are, are related, but they're related by, by potentially nonlinear uh, uh, transformation. Um, and there's a lot of reason for that. I mean, you could even ask the question of like, why not just like do surgery and, and, and just measure the sensitivity of someone's codes directly? I, I think we would all agree that the thing's a little bit uh, uh, barbarian. Um, but the larger question of, of given an input color, how to reproduce it with three primaries that are fixed uh, in your screen was a big challenge in, in, the, in the 1800s, 1900s, uh, and one that took people a really long time to get right. Uh, so in fact, uh, this, this uh, organization, CIE, um, which is in France, uh, and I believe it continues to exist today, uh, uh, developed the sort of first system for doing that. Uh, and it looks something like this. So they had this fun experiment, <laughs> they tried to not fall today, um, where they have three different light bulbs, and uh, then they have some color that they display to the experimental subject. So they take some physical object, they put it in front of you, and now you get three knobs to turn. And these knobs were essentially controlling the lightness of these three different light bulbs. And then what they displayed to you uh, was just the combination of those three colors right next to the object you're looking at. Right? And so the experiment that CIE carried out uh, is, is, is essentially how do you uh, match uh, the, the different colors um, uh, uh, using these, these three controls. But they're particularly sneaky about how they designed this experiment. In particular, the light bulb that they chose over here, they chose to have the spectrum which was more or less just one wavelength. Right? And so the reason that they did that is now for each wavelength they repeat this experiment, and what they get out are three, color, uh, three numbers, right, for red, green, and blue, that correspond to what your eye perceives as each of the wavelengths. Right? So you get these three functions of wavelength that are your, your excitement. Yeah. Uh, and then, if you invert that matrix, you can sort of see uh, uh, the, the basic primary colors, which are the sort of the three light bulbs that do the best job uh, in producing the color you see here. Yeah. And so what CIE determined as the primary colors, which again have nothing to do with how your rods work, right? Your rods are sensitive to lots of different colors, uh, are, are roughly uh, 700 nanometers for red, 550 for green, and 435 for blue. Uh, and, and the reason they chose this is because you could more or less produce all the visual uh, uh, wavelengths when, when these colors are coming up. Now I said more or less, but I talked about matrix numbers, and somehow it's like not clear, oh, why, why do I have to fudge it like that? Uh, and the reality is, um, there are certain wavelengths, where when you invert that matrix, what do you get? You get a negative value here in order to, to reproduce color. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so essentially the primary you chose in, in such a way to kind of minimize uh, the amount of space where that happens. Uh, and in practice, how do we how do we display these things? Well, one thing you might do is add, you know, what is it like rising water or something? Raises all shit. Uh, you you might add a little bit of the other two colors uh, and, and weaken the the, the, the the saturation of your color uh, in exchange for display. Right? In, in other words, kind of uh, change it. Okay, so that's our our, our basic recap here. Is that the spectrum is infinite dimensional. Your cones are three dimensional. Uh, and, and because of that, you get these objects called metamers, which are colors that are different in nature but look the same to you as a human. Uh, and, and CIE uh, tried to measure uh, this response and, and in particular chose three primary colors that they thought could more or less visually reproduce all the different colors of light we, uh, we see today. Yeah? Um, any questions about that, that basic setup? You see lots of linear algebra and discovery and experimentation. It's kind of cool that it's like, yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, is the set of, uh, uh, is the basis for the set of, of colors that compute all the computers can generate the same? Sure. The answer is emphatically no. I guess what I mean is actually like is the space the same and we just use different bases or are there different spaces? Ah, yeah, so there are many different bases for color space. Um, so CIE is one that's sort of perceptually motivated. RGB is the one that you guys have worked with for the most part, and that just has to do with the voltages you send to your computer screen. Um, there, I, and we'll actually we'll come back to that in a minute. There's, there's a few more that are useful mostly for artists uh, uh, care about this because different bases sort of make different relationship between color more or less clear. Um, so there's no right answer here, right? I mean, essentially you get three numbers, but you can choose what those three numbers are. Yeah. Okay. Right. So 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 we could also ask uh, you know questions about measuring, uh, 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 building a measurement device like a camera, and now that we know more or less uh, the, the 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 wavelengths your eyes are sensitive to. 
Um, you can use filters like that to, to design uh, a nice uh, sensor. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, you know, sometimes we need negative spectra, and, and, and so um, in reality, what CIE kind of does is, is introduces some new tristimulus curves, which aren't quite right, <laughs> uh, 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 but are non negative. But, and the way that they do that is they say, okay, well, if to reproduce the actual color out of the, 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 the three light bulbs that I have would require a negative amount of light, then instead I'll just raise the other two. Right? That's why you see this little spurry. So. Okay. Okay. so to come back to this question about different bases for color, there are many. Um, and, and they lead to some really interesting diagrams. Probably if you guys have gone shopping at Best Buy, you've seen diagrams that look like these. They're called chromaticity uh, uh, diagrams. Typically, by the way, for these things, what you care about is the gamut of color other than brightness. It's pretty easy to get light or dark pixels just by adjusting the amount of light. Um, and so essentially, uh, 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 these, this diagram is roughly trying to show you where the spectrum of visible light ends up in this basis. Right? So here is the CIE basis X and Y. Uh, and, and this is the, the visible spectrum. Outside of this is this stuff you can't see. Um, okay. Uh, now uh, we've got to talk about your computer screen and how to model it inside of this. Of course, the irony being that I'm just showing you this on a slide, which is itself being displayed by a screen. So, so probably, like, you know, there's some pieces of this that look more or less flat, and that's because they probably are. Um, right. So, so what does your computer screen do? Well, in, in, in reality, remember, it has three light bulbs you can work with. Yeah? So that's like three points in this diagram of all the stuff you can see. Why it's a horseshoe, actually? I don't know. There's a really famous statistical paper, by the way, that shows that like, on average, low-dimensional projections tend to make horseshoe shapes um, independently of this. I always wondered if that's really. Uh, but in any event, so your computer screen has three different colors it can produce. And so remember we talked about barycentric coordinates? Exactly what's going on here. Right? So in order to produce some color on the inside of these things, Essentially, the way that you get the intensities here is just like the very centric coordinates of that point inside that triangle. Yeah? And, and in, in this piece of, of the visible spectrum essentially is, is negative light, right? meaning that you just can't reproduce these colors using your display technology. Yeah? Uh, and so the, the key word here is gamut. This is the set of colors that are uh, representable using a particular device. And obviously, it depends on the device you have. Right? Like this clock in the back of the room uh, has a gamut of like one point. Right? It can make red. It's really good at it. It can't even make dark red, it just makes red. Yeah? Uh, whereas like the projector, our, our laptop screens all have different gamuts, uh, and, and, and because of that have different uh, uh, views. So for instance, HDTV has a gamut that's kind of focused right in the center of, of our, our visible color uh, spectrum. Going back to my favorite examples, the gamma, the gamut of a set of crayons is discrete. Okay? I can't get color halfway between two colors of crayons. Um, uh, and, and essentially, one, one good way to sort of analyze or, or understand the display uh, technology is to see the, like what chunk of the visual spectrum it, it, it carves out. Right? Because there's a really high quality display, might be able to capture these really vibrant colors that don't appear all that often in nature, so we're not terribly worried if our TV can't reproduce them exactly. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it would be nice if, if we could do it. Yeah. Uh, it also means that in the circuitry of your TV, there's some pretty crazy stuff happening because every TV has a different, you know, triangle there, and then there's some change of basis that has to happen. Because what wouldn't be so good is if your cable TV had to send different tristimulus values to every 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 TV set. Um, yeah. Uh, this this isn't the only color uh, 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 basis. There are many others. So um, another one that's, that's very popular is called LAB. It's popular among artists. So this was the result of a perceptual study where what they wanted was that the distance between colors is roughly the distance you perceive. So they did these studies that are like, on a scale of one to 10, how different are these colors? And then they tried to make it so the distances between these points kind of reflected that, that perceptual thing. Um, another one that's popular in, in artist uh, software is something called hue, saturation, and value. Uh, so here, uh, the, the model is that hue is kind of the color they managed to make it into a circle somehow. Um, what you think about it is a little weird, right? Because it kind of links high and low wavelengths together, but that's what they did. Maybe there's some perceptual reason, I actually don't know. Um, saturation goes from the center outward, that makes more sense. It's red, middle is white. Right, so the philosophy here was like, all the colors look the same when they're unsaturated, but they all look like white. So somehow that should be the center of some big circle. Um, and then uh, value is, is kind of the brightness. Uh, there's one more color system that's really important to know about, and that's the one inside of your printer. 
you up. This is thank you. So it's called CMYK, Cyanta Magenta, Cyan Magenta Yellow and Black. I'm a little tired today. Uh, right, and, and and the basic difference here is that your computer screen outputs light. Right, its job is to it has a little light bulb so it shines them outward. Yeah. Uh, your your printer does the opposite of that. Right, it has a white sheet of paper and it puts color ink down, and effectively that's absorbing more light. Right, the more ink you add, the more light it absorbs. Yeah. So this is called a subtractive color system, right? Uh, and, and roughly, how do you get its uh, cyan, to, uh, uh, yeah, cyan, magenta, and yellow? Is it the sort of the opposites, right? So, so uh, it's like everything except for one of the, the primaries. Yeah. Uh, why do you need black? Those are answers you know. Like, uh, 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 you could uh, get black uh, color uh, in, your, in your printer by just combining all the other guys. But when you get black, you get like kind of brownish. But uh, you could you could get close, right, depending on the gamut that you have. Um, the, the the real reason they do that is that the reality is that most of the documents that we print are black and white, uh, so it makes sense to have a, just a dedicated cartridge in your printer for that. Yeah. Uh, especially if it's, it's more crisp that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, right, a big issue in, 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 in printer engineering is, is bleeding colors, right? And if, if you're combining three different colors of ink on the same spot, there's some probably Because of that, CMYK is, is kind of non-unique, right? There's actually kind of some cool computation that happens in your printer. You can kind of strategically use black to modify the brightness of the other three colors. Right? So, so there's a little bit of non-uniqueness that can happen. Okay, so our, our, our high-level summary so far is, of course, that the, the basically it's all just linear algebra again. I'm sorry, there's no escaping uh, from that in this, this course. Um, and, and it's really complicated because all our bases are, are, are not orthogonal. And, and equal spacing in perception isn't the same as equal spacing in light energy. It's not the same as equal spacing in computer screen and, and so on. And so forth. Yeah. Uh, there are all kinds of other uh, challenges that appear in color display. Another big one that your instructor never gets right uh, is gamma correction. Uh, so, so, so one thing that we haven't talked about yet, we'll, we'll, we'll return to a little in, in a few lectures, uh, is how your actual display works, right? Uh, and and Roughly, there's an assumption that we've made so far, which is false, that like, you know, double the amount of electricity that goes into my light bulb, that the price should double. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're really should be taking the extreme and have like some crazy nuclear reactor in your, your dorm room, right? So at some point, this thing like levels off, or the light bulb explodes. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the reality is that there's some uh, uh, encoding, and in fact, that's also true for your visual system. Uh, almost more importantly, so so uh, uh, your visual system is, is is really sensitive to ratios. I don't know if you guys have seen all these, these fun experiments where like, if you put two really close colors right next to each other, often you'll actually perceive the line between the, those two uh, things. Uh, even though if you like put a little bit of space between them, you won't, they'll just look the same color. It's because your eye actually is computing some derivatives, like it actually knows spatially that that's something change. Um, but because of that, uh, sort of one, one of the things that, that a lot of the kind of early computer graphics people notice is that if I have a really bright color and I double its brightness, I don't actually perceive that that much. If I have a really dark color and I double its brightness, that matters a lot. Right? Uh, and so oftentimes graphics uh, systems will actually store color on log scale. The idea being that really I should have more bits of precision for dark colors than light ones. Right? Uh, and, and, and this is uh, roughly the idea of, of gamma correction. Right? That so far we, we sort of thought of these RGB colors as just evenly spaced between 0 and 1. Um, but you might not want to do that, right? Uh, and, and, and so uh, this, is, this is one technique for doing that. Which is that typically we don't encode digital images linearly. We actually apply uh, a 1 over gamma to your image. Uh, and then you have to undo that when you display it. And the reason is that that gives you some more bits to work with in the parts of, of, of color that are, are sort of perceptually relevant. Um, so for instance, uh, actually here you see uh, uh, the difference. So this is a like this would be kind of like remember that experiment where I turn the, the the crank on my light bulb and I change the brightness. That's kind of what's going on here. And the kind of funny thing is that if you do linear spacing perceptually, uh, right? This one kind of looks like an even gradient. This one looks kind of lopsided. This is the one that's actually even, yeah? uh, at least from a, uh, a, a intensity perspective. Uh, and, and so that's some sort of motivation behind gamma. This is also like one of the number one sources of bugs in graphics code because nobody can ever remember when taking something to the 2.2 to the power, to 1 over the 2.2 power, I don't know. I never get it right, and so I always have to guess. Um, 
And to make matters worse, for a long time, Macs and PCs had different gamma values. Um, actually, well, I'm not sure if that's true anymore, because at this point, displays are kind of interchangeable. Does anybody know? I don't know. But it's a, it's, a, it's a key annoyance because like you display, I remember on old computers you like display a photo on your PC and then you display it on the Mac and like you would look really good on one and bad on the other. And it actually wasn't your fault, it was that like the person writing the display code got gamma wrong and then fixed for your, your PC image on the Mac or whatever. Um, so anyway, just to be aware. Uh, right, so I think, yeah, the, the difference was there's a 2.2 I think on PCs and 1.8 on Macs. So. Any questions about uh, gamma correction? All right, folks, well, that, that basically uh, does it for today. So next time we'll talk about graphics hardware. I think it fits in better because after that, we'll talk about display technology as well. Uh, don't forget, your last homework is due tomorrow. And then from here on out, it's your uh, your project, which I'm, I'm hoping, I'm excited to see all the cool stuff you guys make. But not this one. Right, so, uh, have a great Thanksgiving, and I will, uh, I'll see you all next week. <laughs>